behalf of the Socialist Caucus and those friends of Professor Baran who helped us organize this conference, I welcome you here tonight. When we were planning this conference, the first person we thought who should be here was a man who has collaborated and worked closely with Paul Baran for many years. That is Paul M. Sweezy. The friendship between Sweezy and Baran, who worked together on monthly review since 1949, has flourished through articles in monthly review, and finally now, last week, Monopoly Capital, the long-awaited analysis of American society and economics from a Marxist point of view, has now appeared. Mr. Sweezy sent us a message, and I can think of no more fitting way to open this conference than to present you this message. I much regret that prior commitments prevent my being with you to commemorate the second anniversary of the death of my friend and collaborator, Paul Baran. As one who knew him well for a quarter of a century and worked closely with him for 15 years, I can testify to his greatness of mind and spirit. With his death, Stanford lost one of its most brilliant teachers. The American academic community lost a profound scholar and critic, and the world revolutionary movement lost one of its most original and devoted thinkers. It is fitting that his memory should be kept alive and honored by members of the faculty and student body of Stanford, who are justly proud that his presence on the faculty did so much to add to the university's worldwide prestige. May it continue to treasure and be worthy of his legacy. To you, Mr. Chairman, and to all participants in this event, I send greetings and best wishes for a most successful conference. Paul M. Sweezy. Professor Moses Abramovitz was one of Professor Baran's closest friends on the faculty. Professor Abramovitz probably understood him best of all Baran's associates. Stanford University, as you know, has one of the finest economics departments in the nation. And one name that bespeaks its, its greatness is Professor Abramovitz. He has written several books, two on business cycles, and a further one on employment in Great Britain. I give you now Professor Moses Abramovitz, former chairman of the Stanford Economics Department. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, the occasion for this meeting is the second anniversary of the death of Paul Baran, who was a very important figure in a most important strain of uh, modern thought. He was a great exponent of Marxian thought in its broadest branches. He occupied a place in Marxian economics which in his generation I imagine he shared with no more than two or three others in the world. And he made his contributions to Marxian thought at large and to Marxian economics here in this country under circumstances which required of him not only intellectual gifts of the first order, 
but resolution and courage, which are vouchsafed to very few. And it's appropriate that this meeting, which has its, as, as its occasion, the anniversary of his death, should take place here at Stanford because it was, after all, here that Baran spent the last 15 years of his life, which were the years of his maturity, the time when he actually produced those articles and those books on which his influence <coughs> and his contribution rests. And it was here, of course, that uh, he taught successive classes of students and came to exercise a personal influence more intimate than uh, his writings. But I take it, if I sense the mood of this meeting, that the mood is not that of a memorial meeting. We are here, if I may speak somewhat bluntly, neither to bury Baran nor to praise him. The mood here is neither that of mourning nor of eulogy. The mood, I think, is rather one of examination. Examination sympathetic but critical. And it's examination, I think, in a specific context. Baran was a representative of what I think we may call the old radical left. And the old radical left had a particular character. It was, of course, the Marxian left. And it derived from Marx's analysis of the viability and prospects of capitalism and Marx's and Lenin's view, views about the frozen character of political and social institutions and therefore of the inevitability of revolutionary violence. And <clears throat> uh, this old revolutionary left now confronts a new left, one still in search of its own character. And we only have to look at the titles of the meetings that have been arranged for this conference. The elusive new left, the new radicalism, emergence or revival. Now, if this new radical left is in search of itself and in a mood of examination, then to hold a conference centered on Baran's thought and Baran's writing is really to examine the question, what does the old radical left have to say to the new? And the need for that examination is, I believe, all the more intense because things are clearly not shaping themselves according to old formulae. And let me illustrate that in just two ways. We had a visit here just this week from a Hungarian professor, the head of the Department of World Economics in the Karl Marx University in Budapest. And I had lunch with him. And I put to him the following question. What is the communist view today about the viability and the prospects uh, of Western industrialized countries. Is it what it was a generation ago? 
Is it still expected that these Western industrialized countries are not viable and that their prospects uh, are poor? And his answer was, as I expected it would be, that communist views have changed, that in their view, Western industrialized countries are not only viable, but had been and seemed likely to prove to continue to be successful in, if I may use a Marxian phrase, the organization of productive forces for development. And my next question to him was, uh, do you suppose, do you explain this as the result of the fact that either by our own choice or because it has been imposed on us, we have been maintaining a huge military budget which has sustained demand and activity? And his answer was yes, that's partly the case, but more fundamentally, it's because Western industrialized countries have proven to be much more flexible, much more adaptable in the reorganization of their economic institutions than we had expected them to be. And then he added slyly, you seem to have found a way to incorporate more social control into your private enterprise systems than anybody could have anticipated. And of course, there's another side to the same story. It's perfectly clear that Eastern Europe is itself groping towards more reliance on market forces to organize their own uh, economic activity. And all this suggests that the dichotomy which existed in the old radical thought between capitalism and socialism stands in need of some further examination. But I would go on to say that viability and growth are not the same thing as optimality. What I have had to say and what he had to say says nothing about justice in the distribution of goods. It says nothing about the quality of output. It says nothing about the quality of society and of the man being produced in society under Western enterprise in whatever variant that exists. And that brings me to my second point, which has to do with Baran's views about social science here in the West. Those of you who know something about him and his work know that he was contemptuous of Western social science. He felt that its empiricism was a false and exaggerated aping of physical science. He called us intellect workers as distinct from intellectuals, puzzle solvers, busying ourselves with small questions on the pretext that they were quantifiable because we fear to deal with large questions which might not be quantifiable. He considered our ethical neutrality a pose behind which we avoided dealing with the social criticism, which was properly the business uh, of social scientists. I don't want to comment on this. This is something you're going to go into more deeply. I rather expect that Professor Marcuse will have something to say about it later this evening. I would simply add this to enforce what I had to say about the need for examination in the course of this conference rather than eulogy. Social science could not tackle until lately many of the larger questions on the basis of experience uh, that Baran would have had it deal with. 
And the same, if I may say so, was true of Baron's predecessors in Marxian thought. And simply for this reason, there was never during Marx's lifetime any industrial society organized on other than what we would today call a free enterprise basis. And there was never in Baran's lifetime more than one such uh, a society until the last decade or 15 years. And that one, of course, was still in the course of industrial development and developing under the most difficult uh, conditions in the face of international hostility and partly uh, uh, under conditions of, of war. But those things are changing very rapidly today and new experience is pouring in on us uh, from a variety of directions. We have a great, uh, what, uh, uh, reform, a great uh, experience or series of modifications which are going on on the side of Western enterprise uh, economies. We have a variety of societies growing up uh, under socialist aegises. On the western side, you have economies ranging all the way from, let's say, Switzerland to Sweden. And on the side of the planned economies, societies ranging all the way, let's say, from China to Yugoslavia. And the question can now be faced in a way in which it could not be faced hitherto. What kind of quality of society is being built and what kind of man is being produced in those, uh, in those societies? The answer to the answer to that question, I can contribute nothing this evening. I can contribute little if only in the light of an old Talmudic saying which says, without love and sympathy, there can be no deep understanding, and without deep understanding, there is little chance of constructive criticism. I was an old and I hope dear friend of Paul Baran, but so far as the intellectual stance that he adopted is concerned, I was an outsider. I think that may be less true of the man who uh, will uh, uh, bring to you the main course of this evening's meal. Professor Marcuse, like Baran, enjoyed a continental classical education. He has been and is a distinguished philosopher, a political philosopher by specialty, a longtime student of Marxian thought, now professor of philosophy at La Jolla, and he will speak to us this evening, and I'll try to get this right, on Baran's critique of modern society and of the social sciences. Professor Marcuse. I was grateful to have your invitation to come here and to recall to you and with you uh, Paul Baran, who was not only my friend, but also, although he was much younger than I, in a way, my uh, teacher. I believe with uh, Professor Abramowitz that the best way 
to recall Paul Baran is not eulogy nor personal memories, but to attempt an evaluation, presentation and evaluation, at least of some points of his critique of the social sciences and of his critique of society. And that is what I intend to do tonight. Only one remark uh, in order to uh, clarify my position after what uh, Professor Abramovich has said here. I slightly disagree with him in his evaluation of the relation between the old and new radicalism or the old and new left. I believe and I hope that what I have to tell you tonight will make it clear that the new radicalism grew out of the old radicalism, built on the foundations of the old radicalism, extended the old radicalism, and that on the other side, the old radicalism, if founded as it was, on a scholarly analysis of society, the case of Baran, that the old radicalism today is still as young as it was when Baran wrote and even before Baran wrote. Perhaps it is younger today than it was 10, 20, and 30 years ago. Paul Baran, as you know, was a Marxist scholar and he was proud of being and remaining a Marxist scholar in spite of the apparent or real contradiction between the actual development of capitalist society and the development of the society predicted by Marx. The question I want to ask is why did Paul Baran as a scholar and as a good scholar, remain loyal to a radical theory which was to be the guide of a radical political praxis. Why did he remain loyal to a theory which professed openly to be a revolutionary theory by virtue of its scientific foundation why did he remain loyal to such a theory at a time when the basic concepts of this theory seem to be seriously questioned, if not refuted? My answer is a twofold one. To Paul Baran, the Marxian method was and remained the only one appropriate for the analysis of capitalist society. And secondly, the results obtained by a Marxist analysis still correspond to the reality of capitalist development today. I would like to discuss the topic assigned to me by first dealing with Paul Baran's critique of the social sciences. In his critique of the social sciences, he emphasized the dialectical element in the Marxian method. The sentence he liked to quote again and again the truth is the whole. The truth is the whole. To him, it was a revolutionary principle of thought. A revolutionary principle of thought because it broke with the fetishism and reification, with the fallacy of misplaced concreteness, prevalent in the social sciences, 
a pseudo-empiricism, which in his view tended to make the objectivity of the social sciences a vehicle of apologetics and a defense of the status quo. Baran defined this dialectical principle negatively, and I will read you the definition, the short definition he gives in the commitment of the intellectual. The principle, the truth is the whole, carries with it the inescapable necessity of refusing to accept as a datum or to treat as immune from analysis any single part of the whole. I would like to supplement this negative definition by a positive one to the effect that in and for the social sciences, every particular phenomenon, every particular condition, every particular trend in a given society must be analyzed and evaluated in terms of its relations to the whole, that is, to the established social order. Isolated from this whole, the respective phenomenon, condition or trend remain a false, at least incomplete and inconclusive datum, concealing rather than revealing its true place and function in the social order. And as to the social order itself, this whole social order as a concrete whole is determined and defined for Baran following Marx by the material process of social reproduction and by the hierarchy of functions and values established in this social process of production. But the concrete relation between any particular fact, datum, condition, or trend on the one side, and the whole social order on the other, is never a direct and immediate one. It is always established through various intermediate factors, agencies, and powers among them psychological factors, the family as agent of society, the mass media, language, images prevalent in a society, and so on. I would like to mention here that precisely in this uh, emphasis on the intermediate and intermediary factors, between the particular datum on the one side and the social order on the other, Baran tended to minimize the importance, the increasing importance of psychological factors. This was perhaps the only, or at least the main point of difference between us. He wrote an article in which he, uh, for example, attacked psychoanalysis on grounds which uh, seemed to me uh, obsolete, accusing Freud of a narrow uh, biologism, seeing only in the instinctual structure of men biological forces, and uh, not uh, seeing, Baran not seeing, to what extent the apparently only biological concepts of Freud were loaded with a social content, for example, to what extent the reality principle in its effect on the instinctual structure was not a biological but a, a social and historical principle. Now, the whole which 
is the target of the uh, analysis in the social sciences, is not something thought out by the philosopher or the social scientist. It is not, as it is so frequently called, a hypostatization. It is rather the real concrete which shapes the existence, the life, the function and prospects of every single one of us, of every single member of the population of a given society. This whole is nothing abstract. It is the most concrete power that exists. And precisely in this power of the society as a whole, unmastered by the individuals, expresses itself the negative feature of the capitalist, and not only the capitalist system, of any society in which the process of production and reproduction takes place unmasked and uncontrolled by the individuals themselves. Now, Baran believed that a social science which neglects this dialectical relationship between the particular conditions and facts on the one side and the whole social order on the other, that such a social science succumbs to the fallacy of misplaced concreteness, that such a social science is necessarily uncritical because it takes for a neutral objective datum, that which in reality is in a literal sense a made datum, such a science cancels or conceals the factors behind the facts. And since social science deals with relationships between men, it conceals the social interests and powers which make the facts. Let me give you two examples. I'm sorry to interrupt, but a small part of Mr. Marcuse's address was lost while the operator changed tapes. The first example about which he spoke was election returns and to what degree such returns are true indications of democracy functioning at an optimum level. Mr. Marcuse goes on. Such a study takes usually as final data the two existing parties, the mass media, and what is transmitted as information by the mass media, and it takes as granted a self-determination in choosing a candidate, what may well be the result of a long-term indoctrination and manipulation. In other words, taking all these facts, merely as facts, and not looking for the factors which make the facts and determine their power and the direction in which they work. Such studies may well call choice what in fact is not really a choice, what amounts to a no choice between pre-given and pre-established facts and candidates. Second example, public opinion polls which fail to relate to the framework of choice and expression, fail to relate to the degree of indoctrination preceding and resulting in the freely expressed opinion. They abstract 
from the institutionalized social repression caused by the normal pressure in the society, pressure exerted by the newspapers, the neighbors, status, job, and so on. The same relation, or rather failing or missed relation, between the fact of public opinion and the factors that make the public opinion. The pollsters working in the service of the powers that be may thus well be in the situation of the makers of public opinion who afterwards in a scientific way ascertain the public opinion which they have contributed in making. I should like to emphasize that Paul Baran never really rejected or neglected the need for quantitative analysis, the need for statistical work and painful and painstaking statistical work in the social sciences. He never rejected outright even positivism, that is to say the insistence on verifiable experience and observation. This insistence on verifiable experience plays an important part in Paul Baran's work. But he was not satisfied with a mutilated and manufactured experience. He believed that the facts and data of experience would reveal their true content and meaning only if analyzed in the context of the social order as a whole. And that meant for him only if analyzed on the basis of a comprehensive and critical theory of society. Otherwise, the facts would remain mute facts or false and incomplete data. Now, in his critique of uncritical social science, Paul struck at the very roots of the positivistic fallacy with his attack on the positivistic treatment or rather non-treatment of values as lying outside any scientific scrutiny. His analysis of the rela uh, relation between facts and values, his restoration of values as legitimate scientific contents is doubly important. First, because it provides the legitimate theoretical underpinning, the methodological basis for Paul Baran's insistence on the political commitment of the intellectual. And secondly, this restoration of values as scientific objects opened to him a tabooed dimension of the social sciences. Values such as real or professed adherence to certain ethical standards, such as specific social and political aspirations and goals, such as norms of private behavior and so on, are not merely a matter of personal or group preference, but they are in their prevalence, choice and effectiveness, objective elements, factors and forces of the established social order, they are historical facts and forces. And as such, 
as historical facts and forces, values become subject to scientific theoretical criteria for their evaluation. They are social forces which operate in a determinable direction and function in the social order. They partake as negative or positive, as regressive or progressive values and forces. They partake of the historical dynamic of a given society. And this distinction and evaluation, this distinction and evaluation, progressive, regressive, positive, negative, is within the domain of a rational, scientific, objective analysis and definition. With this provocative thesis, Baran has a clear rebuttal of the argument that, I quote, we can never deduce by means of evidence and logic alone any statement concerning what is good or what is bad or what contributes to rather than militates against human welfare. Baran says that this statement is correct but entirely besides the point because the distinction which I mentioned, progressive, regressive, positive, negative, this distinction is never to be made in absolute terms and in the abstract. It is always and everywhere only the question of progressive or regressive in historical terms. That is, in terms of the available material and intellectual resources, the technical means of their extraction, utilization and distribution, and in terms of the historical chances of greater rationality in the sense of human welfare. Let me give you again an example for this concrete and objective distinction between progressive and regressive within a given historical context. The value judgment, progressive or regressive, applied, for example, to the situation in the backward countries today, is translatable into statements of fact concerning, for example, the need for a radical agrarian reform, gradual industrialization, and statements of fact concerning the economic and political function of foreign capital, and so on, and so on. On the basis of these facts, we can come to a more than preferential personal or group judgment, which policy in the backward countries would have the historical chance of progress in human welfare and which would have the opposite chance. And on the basis of such a concrete analysis, the social scientist can then proceed to examine the various means and policies in these countries with a view of their prospective chance to attain the desired end, namely the modernization and humanization of these societies. Along these lines, 
Paul Baran was able to show how the ethical neutrality towards values was in reality a self-imposed limitation of the analysis, a refusal on the part of the social scientist to deal with a whole dimension of fact, often of decisive fact. And in this sense, he called it uncritical and even unscientific. He once called this neutralization of social science a contracting out, delegation of responsibility to whom it may concern, but not to the social scientist himself who was doing the work. Delegating of responsibility not only moral, but also scientific responsibility. Namely, the responsibility of the theoretician to seek the whole truth, not to accommodate to a definition of facts which excludes the most valuable facts, those facts which would imply taking sides, taking position in the struggle of conflicting political movements. Such political commitment is the result rather than the prejudice of theoretical analysis, and it was for Paul Baran an essential element of scientific objectivity. The facts themselves, the ascertained conditions themselves, imply it if analyzed to the very end, imply it such a political commitment, imply it such a taking sides. I will say only a few words on a Barant's critique of a society. I hope that the discussion groups tomorrow will deal more concretely with this question. I want to pick out only what seems to me the decisive and distinguishing tendency. Barant's critique of society, and here I do not distinguish, and it is hard to distinguish between his own contribution and that of Paul Sweezy, this critique of society is focused on one central concept, namely that of economic surplus. I want to uh, discuss, or rather report, very briefly on Baran's use of this concept, because it seems to me a typical illustration of a scientific concept aiming at a scientific fact, which in itself already involves political commitment and taking sides. In the political economy of growth, Baran defines he distinguishes actual and potential surplus. He defines actual surplus, I quote, as a difference between society's actual current output and its actual consumption. And he defines potential surplus as a difference between possible output and essential consumption. In more vulgar Marxian terms, with this concept of economic surplus, the target of the analysis is the contradiction between the available social wealth and its restricted and even miserable utilization between productive forces and production relations restricting and distorting these forces. 
And this contradiction is documented and analyzed concretely in two major areas, that of monopoly capitalism in the United States and in the, the area of the backward countries, and analyzed in the interrelation between these two areas. The result is for Paul Baran a corroboration of Marxian theory reformulated and applied to the transformation of competitive to monopoly capitalism. I cannot go into this transformation and the concepts with which he analyzes it. Again, I only want to point to what seems to me the main focus of this analysis, namely the change in the decisive economic unit from the free competitive private enterprise to the monopolistic or oligopolistic enterprise and correspondingly from free to regimented competition and connected with it the changes in the Marxian concept of value and its relation to price, the whole problem of administered prices, and thirdly and lastly, the change in the structure and function of the industrial laboring classes in the advanced industrial countries. These three areas required a thoroughgoing re-examination and reformulation of Marxian theory. If I said, when I said that to him uh, the actual development of capitalism still corroborated Marxian theory, I do not think uh, we can understand this in the simple terms that if the old theory doesn't fit anymore, you simply add to it new concepts or new aspects until it is indeed uh, fit to uh, comprehend the new phenomena. The decisive criterion, whether such an extraneous addition to theory has taken place or not, is the examination whether the new concepts and new elements can be derived and deduced from the basic concepts of Marxian theory itself as the internal development of the basic concepts. If this is the case, we simply do not have an adaptation extraneous of the theory to new facts, but the new facts, an attempt is made to co comprehend the new facts in developing on the basis of the theory itself the main theoretical concepts. The corroboration or the correspondence between Marxian theory and the development of the capitalist reality, Baran saw in one decisive and general condition, namely that the system can continue to work only with increasing waste and destruction of resources. Productive destruction in the terms of profitability and the continuation of the system. Destructive destruction in terms of human welfare and in terms of what is going on outside the borders of the more or less affluent society. Continue to work only with increasing waste and destruction of resources, reproducing poverty at home and abroad, and intensifying repression and manipulation intensifying militarism and chauvinism, 
and generating in its own growth and expansion new conflicts on an international scale. This certainly was not the dramatic collapse of capitalism which Marx projected, but it was certainly and is certainly very close to the main propositions of his analysis of the capitalist process itself. It can work, it can even expand and grow, but only while intensifying the terrible contradiction between the social wealth and its use and by expanding waste and destruction. Paul Baran was very careful in his prediction of the final crisis of capitalism. He was much too much aware of the overwhelming rationality which contained the irrational, destructive and inhuman forces of the system. He was much too much aware of the effectiveness with which the affluent society shaped the very needs of its population to conform to the requirements of the system. At the same time, and I mentioned it, he was suspicious of all psychologizing of economic and political conditions and relations. He saw in such usage of psychological terms and categories a diversion from the real issues and problems and from the ways of combating the repression. And on these grounds, he was bitterly opposed to the preaching of Marxian humanism. He saw in Marxian humanism, as it has become fashionable during the last 20 years, an escape from the real danger zone of society and a distortion of the Marxian conception itself, an escape from the real test of theory and practice. To him, Marxian humanism was expressed and preserved, aufgehoben, only in the economic theory of Marx and condensed in the concept of economic surplus. This concept contains the basis of the critique of the inhuman society and the drawing of attention to the real technical economic possibilities of translating humanism into reality by using the available social wealth in a rational way in the interest of the society as a whole and not only within the national borders. I centered my uh, discussion on this concept of economic surplus because in my view it unites theory and practice, facts and values, scientific objectivity and commitment. And this unity is anchored in the question, what does this society do with its rising surplus? That is to say, with its growing capability to create a human life for all, with the growing potential for the conquest of poverty 
and scarcity the world over with its growing potential for peace and liberation. Once the analysis has shown that this conflict between the possible and the actual exists, and at the same time that it does not have to exist, that it is not a natural law and not a permanent historical law, once the analysis has demonstrated it, the taking of sides, the political commitment, becomes itself part and parcel of the objective scientific analysis, and neutrality would only amount again to a limitation or restriction of the facts. I have at the beginning raised the rather rhetorical question, why Paul Baran, in spite of real or apparent conflicts with the reality, remained in the Marxian sense a radical. I think I can sum up my answer now in the one sentence. He remained a radical because to him this kind of radicalism was nothing brought to bear on the theory from outside, was not a personal preference, but was implied and involved in the theoretical analysis itself, and therefore was an element not only of moral and political, but also of scientific responsibility. Thank you.